Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, the latest edition in Intelligent Insurer's underwriting series. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I want to say a very special thank you to our speakers and moderator today, who will all be introduced shortly. I'm Kieran Mallion from Intelligent Insurer, and it's been an absolute pleasure collaborating with SEND, Zurich, Nationwide, and EY to develop today's content. SEND helps insurers build agile platforms that streamlines processes and reveals previously hidden insights that unlocks opportunities and provides a competitive advantage. Please do note that you can submit questions and submit any of those questions for our speakers. We will try to get to as many of them as possible. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator for today, Saranya Mohan, who is the founder and managing director at Aruvi Consulting. Saranya, thank you so much for moderating today's panel and taking the reins. I'm really looking forward to what's promising to be a really interesting discussion. Thank you, everybody, and over to you, Saranya. Thank you, Kieran. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, today, and thank you for your time. So I'm the founder and CEO of Aruvi Consulting. We are a boutique consultancy helping insurers and in, uh, uh, everybody in the insurance market embrace change. So we deliver business changes starting from uh, change management through to processes through to the technology side of things. So uh, I'm so honored to be with you all today. And we have got four amazing speakers with us. Um, Tony Fenton from Nationwide, Adam Cherubini from Send, Jojo Dutta Roy from EY, and Jonathan Charak from Zurich. I will let them introduce themselves. So Tony, can we start with you? Yeah, thank you for, for the intro and looking forward to the conversation. It's going to be fantastic. So uh, again, Tony Fenton, I lead underwriting product for commercial lines and nationwide insurance. So all things product enablement, uh, underwriting product, as well as reinsurance. So excited for the discussion today. Thank you, Tony. Adam, could you introduce yeah. yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, I'm also delighted to be here today. Uh, appreciate some time to talk about the topics that we've lined up. Um, just a little bit of background. I have spent my entire career in the insurance industry from commercial lines underwriter to being a retail broker and more recently uh, serving a number of leadership roles within uh, startup organizations. I joined um, SEND as chief revenue officer earlier this year and I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you, Adam. Jojo, can we hear from you next? Yeah, and, and Saranya, thanks for having me here. Looking forward to the conversation. Jojo Dataroy, uh, partner with EY, and I lead our global underwriting team here at EY. Okay, thank you. Jonathan, last but not least. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Schrock. been with Zurich for about two decades, uh, actuary by trade, most of the time in the U.S., as well as experience in Australia, as well as uh, Canada. Uh, last four years, I've been a North America Emerging Solutions Director with the last two years uh, working on standing up Zurich North America's sustainability underwriting team and how we look at taking sustainability into our underwriting practices. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So the topic for today is uh, the courage to implement change within the underwriting um, business and what can underwriters do to prepare for the future. The way we have uh, uh, broadly categorized this talk is into two sections. The first section is where we will explore the challenges that are around today. And then we will move on to what can be done around overcoming those challenges or uh, implementing best practices and uh, looking forward to what's coming tomorrow. So uh, in your view, Tony, can, uh, sorry, in your view, Adam, uh, what are the challenges that are slowing down the underwriters today? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think one of the most critical challenges that, that we see and hear daily from underwriters is uh, it's, it's just a tsunami of information that's coming to them. Uh, they have a, uh, you know, ever growing volume of submissions coming at them. And I think sorting through all of that, uh, that volume of information has become increasingly difficult. And, and I think what it's resulted in is that, um, you know, underwriters are spending more and more of their time uh, doing non-core activity, you know, not, not actually evaluating risk and 
and understanding is this a risk profile that's good for the company or not. And so I, I think one of the things that we're seeing more frequently from the folks that we're speaking to is that historically the way that a lot of insurance carriers or risk bearing entities would solve for some of the challenges that we're seeing in the underwriting domain is to just add additional headcount. You know, that that was the solution of choice. You just add bandwidth and try and keep up with what's going on in terms of complexity, uh, data integrations, and so on and so forth. Um, what we're seeing now is leading companies are embracing technology and, and using technology as a uh, aid or an enhancement to the underwriting function. And, and those that are doing that, you know, we're seeing creating a significant competitive advantage. Um, they're, they're generating superior results. They're, they're putting time back in the hands of the underwriting function. And so um, from where we sit, you know, we think that the, the human underwriter is going to remain incredibly important within the overall transactions of insurance, um, particularly in the commercial lines and specialty lines of business. But, but in order for those individuals to be successful, we, we do think that there has to be this kind of investment in technology. And, and, and what that looks like is creating, if you will, kind of a, you know, single, uh, you know, single platform that that allows these underwriters to maintain accuracy, um, maintain, you know, some of the fundamentals of sound underwriting, um, but do it in a way that's much more efficient and effective. And so if you do have that, if you will, single pane of glass, uh, that an underwriter doesn't have to go off to various different um, you know, platforms or interfaces to get all the information that's necessary to underwrite. Th those are the organizations that we're seeing have a lot of success. Um, and so th those are my initial thoughts just to kick things off. Uh, I I'd appreciate maybe what some of the other panelists have to say about you know, what, what challenges are confronting underwriters today. Thank you, Adam. I'm pretty sure this is a question that everyone is uh, <laughs> uh, keen on uh, pitching in. So. Um, Adam, uh, uh, thank you, Adam, again. Uh, Tony, would you like to go next uh, with your views? Yeah, no, I think uh, Adam uh, you pointed out a lot of really good uh, perspective. Uh, and maybe in the intro, uh, two, a little over two and a half decades into the industry, was an underwriter at one point. Just the, the sheer sort of volume of data and uh, parts pieces to be a successful underwriter today is uh, different. And uh, if you think about what I started uh, in the industry 20 plus years ago as an underwriter to being successful today, think about the data, the portfolio, all the parts or pieces to be successful. I think that single pane of glass is really important, but it's taking the tools and really connecting them. And I think about just not just the underwriting piece of the equation, it's all the way through the value chain. I think about loss control services. I think about premium audit. It's finding ways to take the technology and really bring it together to, to make the underwriter most successful because you want the underwriters really investing their time in relationship management, making decisions versus doing the administrative tasks. And I think again, easier said than done. And uh, there's lots of different technology out there, but I think just the sophistication of what's in market today to be a successful underwriter, the pricing tools, the analytic tools, the portfolio tools, it's so critically important. And, and quite frankly, uh, I think underwriters crave that. And uh, it, it's important to uh, sort of listen to understand so you really can build that best in class process. Thank you, Tony. Jojo, uh, would you like to go next, please? Yeah, sure. And, and I think Adam and Tony hit uh, a lot of pertinent points here. A, a couple of things to add, at least from <clears throat> my vantage point, whatever we are seeing in the market is, you know, I, I think the data in today's day and age, there is no dearth of data. There is, I would say that there is an overflow of data and information, right? So if I think about data, it's it's not, a, not just about the fact that I, underwriter doesn't have data it's basically the underwriters need to go through 20 different systems to actually get the data that they want to do the do the right kind of risk analysis and to write to write price right tier 
all of that, right? So I think you know the the technology landscape in itself has has become very very convoluted. And, and to Adam's point, there is definitely a need to provide a single pane of glass for an underwriter where they can have all the information that is presented to them, right, in a structured way. And and again, to Tony's point, it's not only just about the data, it's about the insights, right? What do I do with the data, right? Am I providing the right kind of insights, right? So if I get a submission, do I get a propensity model to see, you know, how much, like, can I cross-sell, right? So those kind of, those kind of insights from an under standpoint, I feel are, are, you know, things that makes the underwriter's job a lot more, uh, you know, pertinent rather than really focusing, you know, on the non-core activities that, that Adam said, you know, that will really focus the underwriter's attention to those points. So I just wanted to bring up those those couple of points as well. Thank you, Jojo. Jonathan, would you like to add to that? I'm pretty sure you have got some interesting points there, yeah. given your uh, perspective from an emerging solutions angle. Well, my team colleagues have mentioned a lot of the very technical points, so it leaves the actuary to talk about the human element, which is you know, not the typical way things go in the world. But really, all of this technology is empowering the underwriter. And it, the technology is extremely important, but we see that customers today are expecting fast and personalized services, but the traditional underwriting processes may not let the underwriter meet these expectations. The underwriters are, are under a lot of immense pressure to balance speed and accuracy while providing this seamless customer experience. And the right tools and technologies are really what allows an underwriter to provide this in a proper fashion of being able to do the risk assessment, doing the un providing proper underwriting expertise Assessing the risk accurately requires that expertise. And when we take this in the fact that we know in the insurance industry, there is a larger aging population and retirements happening where we're losing a lot of skilled underwriting expertise, we need to ensure that our younger and junior underwriters are not going to be spending as much time on mundane tasks where they could actually learn, grow, and develop and become those skilled underwriters of the future as more and more of this will fall on them to take lead. Yeah, if, um, if, if you don't mind, I, I, I might want to add just a comment or two. Um, I, 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 one of the things that Jonathan said resonates with me uh, a, a lot based upon the conversations we're having. And I think it's this notion that underwriters are feeling they can't even get back to 100% of the submissions that come across their desk. And so, you know, it's that tip of the spear almost, the, 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 the ability to do ingest that information in a very organized and structured way so that they can actually view, if you will, 100% of the risks. And they can, you know, take a perspective on, yes, this is a risk that we are, are very keen on underwriting, or this is a risk that maybe doesn't fit our profile. And so still today, what we're seeing is a number of carriers have not fully digitized that front end. And so submissions are still coming in via email. And that email might have attachments, loss runs, or court form, or statement of value, or whatever the case may be. And, and I think Jonathan's point is largely that falls on some of the younger underwriters, the underwriting assistants that are just sitting there day in and day out processing, how do I get that information out of an unstructured view into some kind of structured view that becomes valuable to us to evaluate. And so I think it starts, it starts right from the very beginning, if you will, right from the moment that a third party or a distribution partner says, we'd like to do business with you. How do you start that process so that it becomes highly automated and using technology, I think in a way that you know, allows these organizations, all the carriers to get back to their uh, agents, brokers, or whomever they're using within their distribution realm to, to present their offer. You know, that, 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 that I think it's really important when you look at the total cycle of what this falls on the underwriter's desk is getting back to their partners in a timely fashion so that that, that broker knows, can I count on you or not for the service? 
Jojo, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, and, and, and I think we've, we've pretty much exhausted our list here. I, and, you know, as I think through this topic here, I think the, the other thing that, that presents a challenge in today's, you know, rapidly evolving and where innovation is happening at the, at the pace that it has never happened before, at least from a technology side, we are talking about how to leverage technology. The flip side of technology is also like, you know, the new risks that come with it, right? And I think, you know, if you think about cyber, for an example, right, there are these new kind of cyber exposures that are coming in every other day, right? So, you know, I think from an industry standpoint, right, I mean, it also presents a challenge for underwriters to, you know, and, and we were talking back to one of, our, I was talking to one of my peers who's, who's leading cyber at one of the leading organizations, and they did not have enough underwriters who understood the cyber business, right? And, and there was a dearth um, in the market. So I think it also presents a challenge, right? Because, you know, if we just look at some of these new technology innovations, some of these innovations that are happening, it's also as, as much as it creates opportunities, it also creates risks on the backside of it as well. So I think that's another interesting, you know, dimension from which we should probably look at from an underwriting challenge perspective, because, you know, it's it's always continuously, it's not like, you know, your traditional lines of businesses, which are pretty, uh, you know, which are pretty well understood, right? These are new risks and, and, you know, there is a need for underwriters to upskill themselves continuously in this environment. Thank, thank you, Jojo, and thank you, everyone. Uh, you have uh, all of you have made some really good points. But if I uh, have to uh, summarize them, then I think I heard uh, about three or four uh, key topics that kept uh, repeated by all of you. So one is that there are quite a few tools in the toolbox, so it's easy or it's so overwhelming on the underwriter as to which tool to use uh, for which job. Also about the technology uh, and data. Again, uh, how, uh, there is a lot of data, but how do we make sure the right data is being picked up and that data is of absolutely uh, pristine quality to help with the job. And then the talent crisis and the human component that goes with it. That was a topic I believe uh, every, it was everyone's favorite. We are going to cover all these broader categories in a bit more detail um, throughout the session. So. Uh, everyone, please hang on uh, because it's going to get more interesting and we're going to hear more from our speakers. So let, let's talk a little bit more about the underwriting uh, process itself. So now let's move on from talking about the challenges and then move on to talking about how we can uh, overcome them. So what will it take to bring more clarity to the underwriting process? How can we make sure the underwriters feel more empowered in their day-to-day -day job? Tony, would you like to go first? Sure. No, thank you. And uh, I, I think it piggybacks on the first topic very well. We outlined the challenges, but I, I do think some of the challenges breed into the solutions. And uh, we talked about the single pane of glass, but I, I think it's really truly thinking about how you use the technology and data to integrate into an ecosystem for the underwriter. And, you know, as an underwriter, it's not just the risk selection, it's the portfolio dynamics. Uh, to be a good underwriter, depending on if it's small or middle, the dimensions are different, but understanding buying ratios, what's the submission activity, what's the pricing that's coming into the portfolio, being able to really cure the, curate that into a single view. Because again, being an underwriter today requires a multi-dimensional view of risk as well as that portfolio and having that single spot. I think some carriers call it a workbench uh, sort, of, uh, sort of view, but essentially an ecosystem for the underwriter to make the best possible decision decisions, which then drives that clarity of underwriting and speeds up that process. I think another sort of, uh, you know, part piece of this is uh, a lot of times, you know, carriers will fall in love with uh, different uh, data sets or different sort of technologies. Being able to really bring that into the underwriting process versus having it sort of hung outside of the system. And again, I think about geospatial data uh, today in an underwriting sense, being able to know the risk versus we talked a little bit about courts, uh, you know, looking at an accord and sort of looking at the proxies for what we think it is, taking that geospatial data as an example and bringing it into the underwriting system for an underwriter to know the risk, see the risk, but bring it into that work bench environment. So I think it's not only just the integration, it's bringing the clarity of the underwriting process with the right data. 
And the last part of that is, uh, you know, thinking about sort of uh, process mapping. I hate to even say that out loud, uh, but you almost have to, you know, reverse engineer. Are you using your underwriters uh, to the best of their ability? Because again, there's many different steps, many different dimensions to being an underwriter, whether it's the portfolio, the pricing, or the individual risk selection, but making sure you're just continually taking uh, inefficiencies and friction out of that equation. Uh, but uh, those are a few nuggets, at least from my vantage point, because I do think being an underwriter today is just awfully demanding. And for carriers, you have to really think through how do you how do you make that the best possible experience, creating that clarity. Thank you, Tony. Jonathan, can we hear from you, please? Yes, thank you. So uh, Tony brought up some really excellent points. So when we talk about, you know, the quote to issue and all that whole process and understanding all of those metrics. So while we have to develop an efficient process, there's also the advanced analytics that we need to do across that whole process to understand why things are changing across there. So, you know, there could initially be a question of we're getting, you know, we're not getting enough things going from a rate to, to quote or quote to hit. The question also could be is why did we start getting so many quotes that are actually binding? If you're binding too many, then you, you need to always circle back and ask those questions. How are we performing compared to the market? Why are we, why did our bind ratio go from X to 20% above X? You know, what are we doing differently? Now we got to go back and reanalyze is our proposition really is it not, are we getting taken advantage of in the market or are, did we figure out something really good that's making us, you know, doing this in a better fashion? So there's always that, you know, happiness, but skepticism that needs to be taken into account in the process. So while there is the importance of having great underwriting guidelines, having all these other great processes that you need to develop, there's always the importance of verify what you're doing that's to make sure the improvement that you see initially is truly an improvement and not something that three to five years down the road, you're going to realize that you're, you are the naive capital in the market. Thank you, Jonathan. Jojo, would you like to add your views, please? Yeah, absolutely. I was I was taking vehement notes here while Tony and, and, <laughs> and Jonathan were speaking. No, I think all, all great points and, and you know, removing my technology hat for a moment, right? And and you know, as we help as we as I think through, you know, how we have helped a lot of insurance carriers, you know, navigate the underwriting transformation journey. Right. I think we touched a lot on that as well. And, you know, I think Jonathan touched upon underwriting guidance. It really starts on the business side, right? And when, from a business side, there are a few dimensions around product, right? Sometimes, like, you know, a, 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 one of our clients, when we went in, you know, they had so many different variants of products that underwriters were confused, right, as to what differentiation was between one product or the other product. There were variants of, of the same, like, you know, of the same underlying LOBs, if you think about it. But again, at that point in time, like, you know, the client basically said, okay, you know what, we need to rationalize our products. We need to bring it down from 45 to different product sets to 20 different products that underwriters can be focused on and, and sell in the market, right? The second thing that was very important that Jonathan touched upon is underwriting guidelines, right? Is the guideline clear, right? I mean, from the home office or technical underwriting team, there should be a clear guideline around what market-facing underwriters should go out in the market, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of ambiguity that, that sometimes we find in there. And also we've worked with leaders, right, within the organizations. I think the third dimension is around, I think Tony touched upon that a little bit, around process mapping in terms of how do you envision the underwriting process working in the future, right? How many roles are you under, like, you know, looking at? And I'll give you guys a very specific example where we were working with one of our clients and they basically said that, you know, their typical quote turnaround time from the time a new submission request comes in was 15 days, right? And, and if they compared that to their peers, 
like you know it was about three to four days right and it was horrible right and and when we deep dived into the process mapping area we realized that to get out a code in the door there were more than 25 handoffs within the process right seven or eight different roles within the process right so it came down to setting up a few guidelines in terms of how many touch points how many handoffs do you really want in your underwriting process and how many roles do you need to really support it by right and we and and it was interesting because you know here the vision was set around i'm not going to have more than three roles right within the whole process and i'm not going to be hoping to touch the whole submission more than five times right now in complex commercial lines i do understand that that's a stretch because there's always a back and forth between the broker but the interesting stat is the one who gets the quote the fastest to the broker typically has the highest chance of converting that to a bind right so i think those are the things from an underwriting perspective uh, just wanted to share with the group that you know these have been some of the learnings i think you know we've talked about the technology enough as well sure thank you jojo and adam can we hear from you please yeah uh, really great points from the uh, panel here i, I the, the other thing i would add you know, that we see as a positive outcome once somebody starts to deploy technology or if you will, an underwriting workbench. And it's so key to, I think, the long-term success of um, leading organizations is consistency of underwriting across underwriters and consistency of underwriting across territories. And and I think what, what, what a platform can do is it allows um, just that, right? Whether somebody is a 30-year veteran of underwriting or maybe they're at the earlier stages of their career, you can try and close that gap a little bit through the use of technology. And also so that what we sometimes historically have seen is if a risk comes into an organization and it hits one underwriter's desk, you might get one perspective or one view or one price indication. If it hits another underwriter's desk, you might get a completely different view and a completely different premium uh, indication. And so I think the ability for organizations to create a much more um, single view of what they think about risk, how they price for risk, whether it's in one territory versus another, what kind of limits should they be producing, what kind of deductibles should they allow, what type of coverages should they offer. I think allowing an organization to be very nimble in their ability to offer you know, their product in a very consistent way helps the organization, but it also frankly helps their distribution partners, because I think there could be frustration on the part of the broker where one week they get a clear indication that, yes, we want to underwrite this piece of business. And then three weeks later, maybe they get a different indication because it fell to a different underwriter. And so I think that's one of the powers of, of uh, the technology that we see being implemented with, with you know, carriers that, that we're talking to and working with. Thank you, Adam. We are going to continue uh, discussing more about the underwriting process and uh, best practices that we could implement. But before that, before we move on to that, we have already started getting audience questions. And um, one of the questions is more relevant to what we are talking now, um, which is around uh, empowering underwriters. So the question goes, something I have seen in my company is a wealth of older underwriters who view change in the waterfall method as a potential um sorry who view change in the waterfall method uh meaning if any potential system or process update doesn't completely check all the boxes they think are needed they disregard it and speak negatively about it younger underwriters hear this and begin to echo those sentiments which lacks process and innovation how have you combated this change management issue in your companies georgia would you like to go for it yeah sure it's it's a very uh, very interesting question and and uh, so um, I, I think there are two things and and i'm sure the others will chime in that i wanted to bring about one there is a, a necessity right in terms of getting not only technology and people are moving like you know on the technology side we talk about agile and incremental delivery very very um, common I, th I think you know the for technologies it's easy to grasp that knowledge doesn't necessarily has not translated over to the business, right? So when when I think about an underwriting transformation, the first thing that we do is 
to get everybody in a room and get them comfortable with the concept of agile and incremental delivery, right? And historically, right? I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, actually discount this this comment that, you know, that has come in the question. It was waterfall, right? And what used to happen was, you know, business used to think, am I going to get, if I don't get all what I want in my first release, I'm never going to get it. Right, and there were programs that were run by run in that philosophy from a waterfall perspective, but things have changed in the last five to ten years. People are adopting more of an incremental delivery approach from an agile perspective. So, a I would say involve the business in terms of methodology adoption. They need to be comfortable with that. Second, you know, it's important for. Uh, you know, very important to involve the underwriters in the transformation project itself. And in one of the largest transformation projects that we had, we actually made it a point that, you know, there were four underwriters that, that we had who were actually driving requirements from an underwriting transformation perspective. And the way we chose those underwriters, right, was not only based on experience. They were based on age. They were based on years of experience. They were based on, you know, the LOB that they were representing. So getting the right mix of the underwriters with the right experience into your underwriting transformation project right from get-go was very important to drive adoption, right? And they were not only part of, you know, the market-facing underwriting teams, they were also part of the home or the home office underwriting or technical underwriting in some companies, however they want to call it. And those are the people who were really serving as the champions to go back to actually, you know, socialize back with the peers, right? So I think, I think you know, and then, you know, there are obviously other traditional techniques of training people and, and you know, giving them videos, so on and so forth. But I thought those two things were very, very important, right, in terms of choosing the right audience, um, in terms of the underwriting representation in the project, as well as getting business comfortable with the whole concept of agile delivery and incremental delivery. Thank you, Jojo. Jonathan, would you like to chime, chime in? Yes, the one thing that I would add, and I believe everything that Jojo said is truly accurate. I have found use in early on engaging with the naysayers, engaging with the people who are against the change and try and bring them along, bring them into the team, let them have a strong voice with you so they feel ownership they feel like they are part of the solution and they don't feel like they are being dictated, but they become a leader. They become an advocate. So it's, they are part of the solution and not feeling like they, like someone in corporate is telling them they have to change what they're doing. Thank you, Jonathan. Adam, would you like to add to it? Yeah, um, the, the one point, and, and I agree, having that buy-in from the underwriting group right from the get-go is so critical to success when you're deploying technology like this. I would say the other thing, though, that we've seen become a powerful tool to adoption and in a sense that the, the, the organizations investing in the underwriting function in the right way is um, you don't have to boil the ocean with whatever that first launch of that technology is. You know, it. I, I think sometimes there's these uh, wonderful transformation um, uh, projects that are put in place, and and what we see is if you kind of make it into more bite-sized pieces, where you can get some form of improvement launched within a earlier time frame than maybe taking months and months and months to get the full program launched. I, I think it becomes very compelling for the folks in their day-to-day -day job where they see, geez, I've seen some improvement, now I want more versus waiting for the full-fledged end-to-end thing to be developed because sometimes it loses that momentum within the organization. So we like to get in there, get something that's gonna have a meaningful impact on the organization then kind of iterate towards that ultimate goal that they have as an organization you know, through the use of tech. Thank you, Adam. Tony, this is a popular question for everyone. So I'm wondering if you would like to jump in there. 
Yeah, a Adam touched upon many of the points I was going to make is the bite-sized chunks, and you never really arrive. It's uh, when you're getting feedback from you know underwriters or, or technologists in a new process, it's not a set it and forget it. It's not a one-time event. I, I think having a system of feedback and having a system of bringing in the change champions. And I think selecting the folks that are really truly can advocate on behalf of their peer group as well is critically important, but uh, you have to ask and listen. If you don't get the buy-in, you won't get the adoption. And if you don't get the adoption, you won't get the value. So, uh, so I, I do think again, uh, getting the right individuals in early, asking for the feedback. And I think also kind of showcasing and, and not taking for granted the value uh, that, that you're getting from, Either the transformation or a new product, you can apply this to, to many different dimensions. But I think uh, many times if you're close to it, knee deep in it, uh, you, you take that for granted. But I think it's continually sort of showcasing the, the wide piece of it. Thank you, Tony. Uh, well, well, I mean, uh, well, so one of our observations we uh, have made in our deliveries is that uh, getting a uh, the senior leadership's uh, support and getting them to be uh, a strong advocate for the change management uh, approach has helped the uh, uh, people follow it. Uh, and then it has helped the culture uh, and the people um, get along with the agile delivery a lot better than trying to address it from top, bottom up. So that, that, uh, that has really helped us in our deliveries. So, uh, so now uh, let's go back to the best practices uh, we were talking about. So uh, we were talking about how to em empower the underwriters, but in continuation to that, let's talk about the decision making. So uh, are there any techniques or best practices that uh, in your view we could uh, implement which will help the underwriters free up their time and also get uh, faster in their decision making? Georgia, can we start with you? Sure, uh, absolutely, and I think we we touched a few of, few of these right in terms of you know the decision making. It's it's really comes down to you know what you're presenting to the underwriter at the point of decision making, right? And and that's where something like an underwriting workbench becomes very very helpful, right? And and to me, the workbench is basically an ecosystem that you know kind of protects the underwriters from going into 10 different systems, right? It doesn't matter how many different policy administration systems the underlying data is. The the underwriting workbench then provides the single pane of glass, right? And it does all the heavy lifting in terms of all the orchestration, all the data, collecting all the data and presenting it right at the point of decision meeting from an underwriter perspective, right? That's point number one. So point number two is again, like I said, like, you know, there is a plethora of data. What what are you doing with that data, right? Are you providing the right kind of insights, right? Do you have the right kind of insights and dashboards to help underwriters with the decision making, right? Uh, you can make the underwriters' job a lot more easier driving business rules as well, right? A lot of the companies do that today in terms of, you know, defining the eligibility rules and even doesn't even take a look at submissions if, you know, if they are not, say, an, uh, a registered broker with them, right? Uh, or if it's, if, if you're not registered, like, you know, licensed to sell in that particular state, you know, kick out those rules, right? I mean, those are the things that take a lot of time, right? Um, you know, and then, the, a, a big hot topic, and I'm sure the panel will chime in here, is this whole concept of, uh, you know, automation of the submission intake process, right? Uh, no matter how much we put EDIs or like, you know, portals or data exchanges, the fact is the underwriter still has a very strong relationship with the broker. And when they need a faster turnaround, typically it's somebody picking up the phone and saying, hey, I'm going to send you an email. Can you send this back to me? right? That's how it happens in commercial lines, at least, right? And there is there is a lot of focus that the industry is doing, whether it is in terms of insurtechs looking at automating the whole submission intake process, right? So, you know, a lot of insurtech funding has gone in, like, you know, I'm not going to talk about Accord because Accord is relatively more simpler in terms of automating and using OCR technologies, things like that. 
you know, the challenge comes in like you know, the big brokers of the world will never adhere to your card, right? They will they will go with their own format. So how do you how do you basically leverage, you know, AI and machine learning and and you know OCR technologies to automate? And and I can tell you that there is no silver bullet answer to that in the industry. Right, and and it's also and it's it's oftentimes like you know, test and learn. Right, I mean something that works for a particular company might not necessarily work with the others. Right, and we've done tens of the tens of these different POCs, and the answer is very different for every every company. Right, so I would say like you know, automation of of the whole submission intake process uh, is also a key. Uh, from an underwriting perspective, right? And one of the underwriting transformation, our rule of thumb was, you know, the underwriter only touches the submission. Like, you know, from the time a submission comes in through an email, you know, they, they basically send it to a shared in, inbox. And then the next time they touch it, that submission has been cleared. It has been cleared through producer appointment and licensing. It has been cleared through clearance and registration. Everything is there, and the only thing that the underwriter needs to do at that point is just focus on the decision-making aspect, right? So that's 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 essentially how we we made lives a lot more simpler for the underwriters in the whole transformation process. Thank you, Jojo. Uh, uh, being uh... Uh, conscious of the time, um, I'm going to pick the speakers from now on. We have quite a few topics to cover, which are re uh, really important. And uh, I'm sure if time permits, you will all want to pitch in for every topic, but <laughs> in interest of time. Um, Tony, would you like to add to Jojo? Yeah, no, I think Jojo hit on many different aspects uh, that, that make a ton of sense to accelerate the underwriting. I, I like how he talked about OCR. I think about smart ingestion and uh, the ability to speed up the process. And again, I think it's in the small commercial world that the ability to, uh, to really use third-party data at scale to understand the risks, the classification, answer the questions. And again, uh, the, it's sort of the art of the possible. How much of the underwriting can you get done up front? And then back to sort of one of our previous questions, the appetite clarity. Uh, if you're able to really peg the classification, some of the data, the facts, uh, and, and also sort of bring that into a very consistent framework, you allow underwriters to get really consistent outcomes and really speed up that decisioning process. So, uh, so I think the data is really important, but I think it's the integration and the ability to, to make it seamless for the underwriter in the background to, uh, to make those decisions. Uh, maybe in middle market, uh, you know, that's my passion. At one point, I led middle market at Nationwide is uh, being able to really pipeline and then uh, understand the pipeline dynamics of uh, triaging uh, the accounts. So how do you understand the, the, the opportunities you have in your pipeline? What's the qualification? How do you bring those best opportunities forward and invest your time? Because you only have so much uh, time as an underwriter to really think about where you would invest it. And again, that triage process using data analytics as well as your appetite allows you to get to a point that you're investing your time in the best possible way. And again, small, middle, a little bit different, but uh, but I think there are ways that carriers can make that process uh, smoother, faster, quicker uh, for uh, for underwriters, which ultimately is great for agents and customers. Uh, what an agent wants is a, a fast yes, a fast no. They don't want a maybe and small. And uh, you know, in the middle, they want to know who's going to be able to actually uh, provide a solution. So I think this isn't just an underwriter dynamic. This is great for distribution partners as well as customers. Thank you, Tony. Some excellent points made by all of the speakers so far. Uh, uh, let's keep the momentum going. So uh, we are now going to the section where we talk about looking forward. So we spoke about the challenges, how to overcome them, and now it's uh, about looking forward. So Jonathan, I believe this question will be in your foyer. So what, what do you think the companies and the underwriters should take into consideration around sustainability, but also about other emerging risks to be better prepare for what's coming? Right, thank you. So one thing how this could actually tie back to some of the earlier points is when we look at Gen Z, in many surveys, they talk about how they want to work for a company that's both operationally sustainable as well as in what they do. 
so when we look at a war for talent across uh, different industries across within the insurance industry, having a good operationally sustainable company as well as being a sustainably strong underwriting company are ways to attract talent, which helps with many of the other ideas we talked about earlier. And when we think about this, there is going to be environmental risks. So we can look at the forward-looking views of CAT models, of weather patterns in the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So when a company needs to think about their footprint and how, where they place their capital, their accumulation risks, all these other traditional portfolio management concerns, it's no longer a place where we could look at the past 50 years of, 100 years of, uh, of information on where um, cats occurred, where a tornado happened, where a hurricane happened, and assume that that's going to continue occurring in those same areas. We have seen the movement of the of, um, her, of tornado alley moving south and east and growing in width. We have seen uh, wetter, slower, heavier downpour hurricanes. Uh, this is due to the classius Kuiperian equation for every degree Celsius increase in uh, in te in temperature, the atmosphere holds seven percent more water vapor which means that there is longer drought periods followed by heavier downpours, which also means that there's going to be longer, longer droughts and heavier flash flooding with heavy downpours. So places like New York are experiencing heavier downpours of rain, which then means that if the drainage system is not ready for all of that excess rain, there could be more flash flooding, which not only is that going to impact in areas with um, with hurricanes and other areas like that, but now you got to think about when you have risk engineers and other people thinking not just when a loss occurs, but how can you advise your insureds where to place their heavy equipment, where should HVAC be placed and all this machinery? Should it be in the basement anymore? Or should we advise companies to place it on the second, third, fourth floor, some floor that's not going to be flooded, other sort of information like that. So you could think about all of these ideas of how to mitigate against future peril, where, to, where should your footprint be, which means where should you be placing your underwriters, your business development professionals, all of these other standard operating procedures need to be taken into account of where they should be placing to get the business that your organization actually wants to attract and that then needs to get incorporated into your operating plans into your data analytics into all of those other areas such as that and taking this from an idea of um of the risk that also moves to opportunity the opportunity could fall into looking at new and emerging um uh, industries that we see all of these industries that are building up to help provide resilience to climate change. How do, how do these companies develop a net zero economy and what insurance companies are going to be there to help support those new and emergent risks as well as new types of insurance such as parametric insurance which are going to be much more modeling against those type of events occurring and can provide either direct um, coverage for perils or even could be used to complement the traditional insurance products in a way to have a more holistic coverage around around the customer to provide a larger solution. But all of those are ideas that will need that is just the tip of the iceberg in reality of of the opportunities and risks that are happening due to climate change. Thank you, Jonathan. Adam, can we hear from you, please, on your views? Yeah, I think um, what, what Jonathan was speaking to, and, and we hear a lot of this, is that the velocity of change in terms of risk has never been greater. And I think insurance carriers has, have historically struggled a bit to you know, pull together all of the data that they need to make decisions about do they need to change their underwriting perspective on a certain region or territory or product? or is there an opportunity to incubate a new product based upon the data that they're seeing? And so 
I think what we are seeing is the organizations that are making investments in having you know, data lakes and sources of data that become incredibly indicative of what's going on, not only within their book of business, but maybe in the broader ecosystem um, through the use of third-party data. It allows these organizations to, you know, turn on and off uh, underwriting faucets, you know, and, and, you know, lean into certain markets, pull out of others in a more agile, nimble way. And, and it's that velocity that if, if organizations can uh, see these trends developing faster than their competitors, they're going to have a significant competitive advantage. And I think it's, it's, it's happening faster than we've ever seen in the history of insurance in terms of the, the risk changing and the ability to incubate product becomes incredibly important for organizations. And so having a really sound data strategy around that is paramount to what, what I think would be successful in this highly volatile kind of world that we're living in from a risk perspective. Thank you, Adam. Um, so we are uh, heading towards a very important topic that all of you uh, touched upon uh, in the first few minutes of this webinar, uh, talent crisis and the human component of uh, the industry. So not only in this webinar, in, in other conferences that I attended this year, there has been talks about talent crisis that's coming because a number of uh, underwriters are in the aging population and they are about to be retiring shortly, but there are not enough young people filling those gaps and uh, we uh, and the insurance industry is heading towards the talent crisis. So what can the industry do? What can the companies do to, to tackle this crisis? Tony, would you like to go first? Yeah, I know everyone's going to get passionate uh, about this topic because I think some of the, the, the questions that we answered do play into sort of attracting talent to our industry. I think having the right tools, the right technology, continue to advance the equation uh, from a carrier perspective is uh, critically important. I think of it as sort of being a talent magnet. Uh, if we don't continue to reinvent our industry and, and create relevancy for uh, the, the younger, newer professionals that are coming in, quite frankly, uh, they, they won't be attracted to our industry. And then if in industry, if you don't have a, a streamlined sort of technology solution, uh, you won't be uh, a selected probably uh, you know place to work. So I think having the right tools for underwriters is critically important because they want to be successful. I think it's also important that uh, we upskill. I think it's uh, you know critically important understanding the dynamic of our current workforce and not all uh, of our workforce has the same skills, but really painting the picture of where are we today? Where, where are we going into the future and providing those opportunities? And, and again, uh, and nationwide, that's something that over the, the last number of years, we've been really uh, invested in what we call future work, which allows uh, underwriters, all sorts of professionals, not just underwriters, throughout the value chain to really select and upskill skill their talent. But yeah, this is a very real challenge uh, for, for the industry. And if you, you don't tackle it head on, you might not like the outcome. So I think it's really important. Thank you, Tony. J Jonathan, can we hear from you? Yes, thank you. So um, this goes back I think, with the idea that we look at a lot of millennials as well as Gen Z, who are really the new younger cohort moving into the workforce, is that there is a desire to work for companies that are not just a good company to work for, but a company that's also doing good. So it's important for the industry and the company specifically not to highlight, yes, the technological investments, the opportunities for career growth, development, to make sure that the work is interesting and impactful, impactful in the day job, but also that the company has a mission statement that is also that they're going to be a socially impactful company, that they're going to be doing good, that it's a company that's, that's there, you know, an insurance company is there, has a strong balance sheet, but they want to be there for the future. We also as an industry need to explain that we as a company want to make sure that the future is there, that we are not just, you know, that we want to make sure the future is a bright future, a strong future, a good future, that we want to be there with them. And I think that's the importance of highlighting both the importance of providing a good work-life balance and a good work experience through technology, through opportunities, as well as the idea of tying that with being a socially con uh, 
a sustainably conscious company in a way that is saying that we are going to make sure your life balance of the work-life balance is in a place in a world that you want to live in. Thank you, Jonathan. Jojo, would you like to add to it? Sure. And, uh, you know, I, I look at this in almost two different dimensions, right? I think, you know, the first dimension is I think the insurance as industry professionals or insurance industry professionals, the ch in general, I don't think we do a good job in terms of promoting the industry, right? I mean, if you, and why that I basically mean, like, you know, other than, you know, the actuaries, right, who, like, you know, if you talk to the millennials in terms of what they want to do when you talk about, you know, getting into a professional career, like, you know, actual, actuaries have actually done a good job, right? I mean, they, there are folks who are looking to get into actuarial, actuarial sciences, all of that. However, like, you know, if... The, the, nobody wants to know, nobody wants to be an underwriter, right? And it's not because, you know, there they, they are not enough skill sets, people don't want to do it. We don't do enough to basically call out what the opportunities are within the insurance industry. I think it's probably just the nature of insurance professionals in general, right? And we've not done enough. I think we, that is one, that is one. And then once the, these folks are, taken into the firm, and I think Tony was getting to it, how do we make sure that it's, they are successful, right? Tools and technology, very, very important, right? I think the second thing is when I look at, like, you know, how the underwriting profession has typically been done, it's a very apprenticeship-driven model, right? You have a senior underwriter, and then, you know, some you have a junior underwriter sitting right beside the junior and senior underwriter going through this risk. And, and that's how it's a very people-driven relationship, right? And post-COVID, right, that apprenticeship model was challenged, right? And a lot of the insurance companies are now trying to reinvent, saying that how can I give the same experience to junior underwriters, right, in terms of accessibility to senior riders? How can I keep the spirit of apprenticeship going on within this profession? Right. So I almost think about it as we need to do two things well. Right. One, we need to do a better job of telling people that this is really this has a good career. This is a good option. Right. And and create enough, generate enough interest for for people to take insurance as a profession. And second, once they are into it, it's it's incumbent on us to make sure that they are successful as professionals. Right. And that's where. I think you know have the right te tools, technology, as well as leveraging the senior underwriters, or underwriters who are like you know in the brink of retirement, that you know makes sense. Thank you, Jojo. And a last but not least. Yeah, I know. I know we only have a few minutes, but uh, and and I love the comments around this because I think it's it is the lifeblood of this organization, or, or not this sort of this industry, getting young, talented people into roles like underwriting. And if if their first few months is about repetitive tasks and things that feel like it's not being aided by technology, we're going to see massive turnover, which is so costly to organizations. So, you know, I, I think there can't be a better use of uh, resources than to invest in the underwriting function and marry that with all the great technology that's being developed out there. Because what you'll get is very committed people and and ultimately uh, some stickiness around your organization. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's paramount for for forward thinking organizations to you know, pair the human underwriter with leading tech and, and what you get is better results and happier employees as a result of it. Thank you, Adam. And uh, thank you all uh, to all the four speakers for uh, sharing your time with us today. So we have come to the end of the session. I will hand, uh, hand it back uh, over to Kieran. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists today for taking the time to join us. Um, Adam, Jonathan, Jojo, Tony, your perspectives were fantastic on such an important topic. So I really do appreciate your time and thank you for joining us. Sarania, thank you for collaborating with all of our speakers today to you know really hone in on their viewpoints and asking such important questions uh, to our panelists. Um, I wanna say a very special thank you to SEND for partnering with us today on today's webinar and to those 
uh, of you who have submitted questions um, and taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. Finally, I just want to mention that Serenia will be joining us um, and 20 C-level, over 20 C-level executives um, at our upcoming event, Underwriting Innovation Europe. That's happening in just two weeks in London on the 6th and 7th of June. So Serenia, thank you for joining us there, as well as Send, who will be uh, delivering a keynote at the same event. So thank you to, um, if anybody would like to get involved as a sponsor or a delegate for that event coming up in a couple of weeks, then please do reach out via LinkedIn and um, we can arrange a call. Thank you guys all so much again. I really do appreciate it and um, have a great rest of your day. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Bye. Hey, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.